Good morning, Celebration Church. My name is Ricardo, and welcome to Celebration News. If you're a new guest here today, we're so excited that you're here, and we want to get to know you. All you have to do is fill out the Connect card in the seat back pocket in front of you, take it to the Connect table after service, and we'll have a free gift waiting for you. This Wednesday, we have youth group. It's here at the church at 6.30. So if you're in 6th through 12th grade, make sure you show up here, because we're going to have food, games, and worship. It's going to be so much fun, you don't want to miss out. This Friday at 7 p.m., the young adults are having another event coming up. Talk to Kirsten and Jordan for more details. At the beginning of every month, we have Crash Course. Crash Course is where you can learn more about Celebration Church and what we're all about. It's today after second service in the conference room. So if you haven't signed up and you wanna go, make sure you go. The last Sunday of October, we're doing a trunk or treat. If you wanna do a trunk, make sure to sign up on our website. And if you wanna help out but you can't do a trunk, we'll be accepting candy donations out in the lobby. This Thursday, we're having our monthly worship and prayer night. It's going to be so good. It's an extended time of prayer and worship in God's presence. It's going to be here at the church at 7 p.m. Don't miss out. Next Sunday, we're having baby dedications. If you want to sign up, make sure to sign up on our website. Coming up on October 15th, the women are having an event here at the church at 6.30. There's going to be worship and a word, so if you're a lady, make sure you come on by. If you want to keep up with us, make sure to follow us on social and sign up for our email newsletter on our website. And that's what's happening at Celebration Church. Let's continue to love God, love people, and change the world. Good to see everybody this morning. Oh, feel good? Just kind of relax for a little bit? No? Anybody get any good sleep? Yeah. You got some? Anybody didn't get enough sleep? <laughs> Whatever. You came to second service. You got lots of sleep. <laughs> Don't even play. <clears throat> hey, um, we, we're in the middle of a series. We're actually wrapping it up on relationships. And today I, I want to talk about something that I think is very uh, uh, very broad when it comes to relationships. I, I was going to uh, give a, a PG-13 message and talk more about intimacy and what that looks like. And, uh, not, and we're not going to go that way, not because uh, we're uncomfortable going there. Um, I'm very comfortable going there. In fact, I think... The church is probably a great place to hear that kind of stuff. Um, our culture just inundates it, us with it, that kind of stuff so much. Uh, in fact, like, uh, well, I won't go into all the statistics about cell phones. But, um, <clears throat> but I, I just think the church is a great place to hear about those kind of uh, intimate things and relationships. But it's also a very important place to hear more broad concepts when it comes to relationships. So today we're going to talk about a bigger thing that will apply to your marriages, apply to your dating relationships, but it'll also apply to everything else in your life. I think um, the, the, uh, the world we live in is very polarized, isn't it? it? It's very much this opinion over here and this opinion over here and very little conversation happening in between. In fact, our dialogue has been boiled down to just memes we throw on Facebook and caricatures we make of people. And so two opposing sides rarely ever have the opportunity to actually discuss anything of substance. And the same thing is true even in our relationships, isn't it? We, we, they're either all good or they're all bad. There, there's very little real conversation, people coming together, having, having a talk. And uh, today I just want to talk about this idea that there's... There's a better way to have conversation. There's a better way to have relationships than these two opposing sides. Because right? we live in a world where, where people's voices are like the dumbest people on the planet can leverage. Like one of the greatest things about the day we live in is this. Anybody with something to say can say it and the world can hear them. That's a great thing, isn't it? Yeah, you guys already know where I'm going. It's also a terrible thing. Because there's a lot of people that really, like, they don't even know what they're saying, and they're saying it. And, and leveraging uh, the, the, the social media and, and this sort of thing. Like, unsolicited advice is, is the name of the day. It's just, it's the way things are. And, and we live in a world where everyone gets offended, don't we? Like, I... W She's offended that he said this, and he's offended that, that they said this, and, and they're offended that they didn't say this, and like, I'm just offended that everybody else is offended. Like, we're, <laughs> we're always just constantly finding reasons to be offended with, with everyone, and it's, it's a very crazy world. Here's the deal. The scripture has some very plain instructions for us on certain things, and the scripture 
describes Jesus not as just our Savior. A lot of us stop there. He's my Savior. But the early church did not call him Jesus Christ Savior. They called him Jesus Christ Lord, which is a step further than just Savior. That means he's actually the boss. It means he's actually in charge of my life. It means he actually makes the decisions and gives directions. He's not, not a consultant that I go and listen to on Sunday mornings, but he's someone who instructs me and leads me every day and every moment. And here's the deal with, with receiving instruction from the Lord, really like, like following him as Lord of your life, is that obeying the Lord is easy when you agree. Like obedience is very easy when we agree, but obedience is only tested when we disagree. Like it's, it's really easy for me to get my kids to eat steak off of a Traeger. Like that's never been hard for me. Like eat, eat your steak off the Traeger. Like that's not a hard thing to get them to do, right? Like it's never been difficult for me to get my daughter to eat macaroni and cheese. She's all about the macaroni and cheese. But you add any kind of like real substance, real flavor, like something that actually tastes good to the plate, and now it's a struggle getting her to eat her food, right? It's, it's this idea of obedience. It's, it's, it's really only tested when we don't want to do it. It's like putting your young children to bed. Anybody try to put a five-year-old to bed? Like, it, like, it's like the moment you say, okay, it's bedtime, like, all hell breaks loose, right? Like, there's, there's about to be the greatest moment that has ever been. It's about to happen, and they're going to miss it because you're putting them to bed. Like, you are the evil one trying to make them sleep through the most amazing cartoon that no other kid has ever seen. It's about to happen. Like, candy's about to come through the vents of the house. It's going to be amazing. You're like, no, you go to bed. They don't want to go to bed, right? That's why I tell my kids, like, hey, you know what they say about monsters? Like, monsters aren't real. It's a lie. Monsters are real, and they live under your bed. <laughs> like, stay in bed. They're going to grab your legs. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> my wife says, why does our youngest struggle with fear? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But here's the deal, like there are certain things that we, we agree with that are easy for us in the Christian faith, and there's other things we have to obey that are hard for us. It's very easy for us to understand and accept the idea of, I need God's grace in my life. Anybody else know if it hadn't been for Jesus? If it had not been for Jesus, where would I be? This idea that I need his grace in my life, and that I need, I need to surrender some things and repent in my life, we're okay with that. But there are other ideas that are just as important that we often struggle with. One of these is in Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. It says, and then, and this is talking about the last days. So we're talking about hellfire and brimstone and trumpets and like all kinds of, we're talking about the end times. He says, and then many will be offended. They will betray one another and they will hate one another. Paul says that one of the signs of the end times is people holding on to offense. What's interesting is the word that he uses here for offense is the Greek word scandalon. It's the word we get scandal from. But it, it, its real implication is it's not just an offense taken, it's really a trap. It's the concept of a trap, that we are, that being offended is truly a, a trap. Has anybody ever set a trap before? You ever said, like you, you got to get you a, a, a trap, like you, you have mice in your house or mice in your, in your garage and you got to go get, get at some traps and you set them out there. The first thing about a trap is you need like good bait, right? <clears throat> Come on. Somebody said that mice like cheese. I don't know where that comes. I've never seen a mouse in my refrigerator eating my cheese. Never seen it. They're usually eating the gummy bears that I left in my office desk. You know, <laughs> that's, that's usually. But, but they like cheese, I hear. So I'm going to put some cheese on here. <clears throat> this is the best. And like this kind of cheese is, 
amazing. And here's the deal. I really brought this today because I'm not allowed to have this at home. <laughs> I like, you know, that's not good. But if I buy it as a sermon illustration, you can't stop me. And, and this stuff is, is, the best part is, is the film that gets in your mouth. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like eating a nasty hot dog or bologna or something. Like that film. But I figure if a mouse wants cheese, like they also want crackers. Because who doesn't want cheese and crackers, right? And if they're going to have cheese and crackers, they may need to just make it a sandwich. So we're going we're gonna to sandwich it up for, the, for Mr. Mouse today. But really this passage, this idea, this word scandalon gives us, gives us the concept that, that really being offended is a, it's, it's a trap. Offense in our life is, is not just a feeling we have, it's actually a trap. So there's a, there's a bait on the trap, and then that trap is then pulled back. Let me see if I can get it without splashing anybody here. I'm just saying that that's spray cheese is like grease. But what happens is, is an offense is placed in our life. It's like a... It's like a trap just waiting for us. It's, for different people, it's different things, right? For me, it often happens when I'm driving. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like I'll be driving. And usually the fences in my life begin while I'm driving, and they end with my wife saying like, things like this. Honey, you can't do that. You pastor in this town, right? Like, that's, that's usually how it ends up. Uh, for, like the other day. <clears throat> I was, I was driving uh, out of a parking lot. Uh, there was a restaurant. I was coming out of a parking lot. I've never been in this parking lot before in my life. And on the way out, I realized that whoever the engineer was didn't make one driveway that's an in and out for this parking lot. Instead, it's an in driveway and an out driveway. And I didn't realize that. I, I was, it was late at night. Nobody's on the road. And I'm already out in this in driveway going out. And I realized, oh, I'm, I'm in the wrong spot. No big deal. We all make mistakes, right? That's what I thought. But this dude who's coming in, he, he's trying to drive in. He's like honking his horn. And there's nobody else. It's just me and him on the road. It's like there's plenty of time to work with here. He's honking on the horn. He's like giving me the one way to Jesus. You know, like, he's like, he's just, he's just like super upset. And I'm thinking like, what in the world is your problem? Like we are grown adults here. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, just getting super upset. And so I, I put the car in park, and I put it in reverse and drive back to go talk to him. And my wife's like, you can't do this. You can't do this. I'm like, baby, I don't want to fight him. I just want to ask him why it's such a big deal. <laughs> like, the, the old me would have wanted to fight him, but the, the redeemed and sanctified me which just wants to know, like, why are you so upset that I drove out the wrong way. There's a, you should, if I'm going out the in, then you come in the out. Like, not a big deal. <laughs> but then I'll get trapped in this, this thing in my mind where I get offended when I feel like people are misrepresenting me. Because that's where offense comes into our life, isn't it? It comes in when somebody touches on a value in your life. If for you, being on time is always a thing and then somebody calls you late, Boom, you're offended. If for you, integrity is a big thing, and then someone says that you don't have integrity, boom, offended. If for you, uh, being, being generous and accepting of all people is a big thing to you, and someone says that you're not, offended. And, and for me, what it often is, is when I feel like, 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 I'm, like I'm misrepresented. If somebody misrepresents me, or something I love, or or something I lead, or like the body of Christ, it drives me nuts. Like I get so offended. Like I, I get offended when I see Christians mi misrepresenting the body of Christ. And what happens is the devil knows our triggers, and he knows the bait that he uses for us. He, studied, he studies us well. And he'll place that bait in your life. Maybe it's, maybe you get offended because your wife said no. Or not today. So you, you got offended and you felt rejected. And so you, there's a trap set. And if you're not careful, 
that trap will go off and fling cheese everywhere. <laughs> it's like a trap. That's what offense really is. It is a trap in our life that shows up when we experience betrayal or we are falsely accused or we are rejected. In our relationships, we experience offense anytime someone says something or does something towards us or towards those we love that we feel is unjust or wrong. Let me say today, don't take the bait. The enemy of your soul has studied you. He knows where you fail, and so he places the bait of offense in front of your nose and just waits for you to put your hands on the trigger. Let me say it like this. It's impossible to live a full life. With an, with an offended spirit. The enemy of your soul, he, he's come to steal, kill, and to destroy. But the Lord says that he came to give you life and that more abundantly. And so I'm telling somebody today that, that perhaps at some point in your life someone said something, did something, or perhaps they didn't say what they should have said or didn't do what they should have done. Like, like don't allow that trap to hold you captive into the future of your life. An offended life, a bitter life, Unforgiveness in your heart will always prevent you from experiencing the fullness of what God's desire is for your life. And we all have opportunity to be offended, don't we? I, when I say something like this, I'll have people say, I just don't get offended. Like, you a liar. <laughs> you're a liar or you're a toddler, like one of the two. Because the truth is all of us have opportunity to be offended. And, and truly, like, we, we are very sensitive people in our social media-driven world. We, we, our worlds become so small, and we, we get offended over the tiniest things. And, and I would just encourage somebody, like, just smile today. Like, maybe just relax a little bit. Like, maybe don't give so much bandwidth to somebody that you'll never meet in your entire life. You know what I mean? Like, you're offended about what somebody said on social media, and, and you've never met them. You don't know them. Truly, like, if you would just hit unfollow, it would not change the outcome of your life. Stop giving them so much room in your spirit. I want to say today that you can be offended without taking offense. Like, being offended is a natural response when someone violates a value of yours. But it doesn't mean you need to take offense. Like, Jesus says it like this, like, be angry, but don't sin. I'm telling somebody today, it, it, you, can, you, will, you will get offended, but don't take offense. Like, don't slam your hand on the trap. You, you'll see, you will experience the trap, but don't grab the trap. We can see this concept in 1 Samuel chapter 18. David has just killed Goliath, and, um, and they're returning back into the city. It says this, when the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. And they sang and they danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. Anybody want to bring back tambourines and cymbals? Negative Ghost Rider. <laughs> and this was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Can I just pause for a minute and say that's a pretty lame song? <laughs> it must have had a good beat because it's not a good lyric. <laughs> and, and this song made Saul very angry. What's this, he said. They credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. 
from that moment on, not from something David did, not from something David said, but from what someone else unrelated to David said about David. Saul read into that and then interpreted David's motives based on something David never said. And from that moment on in their relationship, it says he kept a jealous eye. He was, he was distrusting. He was jealous towards David. He, he, he had a struggle with David. And this is the way it goes, isn't it? Somebody will say something, and, and we assume that that must mean they all think that. Or, or, or you, you hear something, and you, you think, oh, they're, they're after me to get me. And so now I'm wondering, who else is, is out to get me? Who else should I be wary of? Who else should I be guarded against? And I'm here to tell you today, don't put your hand on the trap of being offended first reason that we don't put our hand on the trap of being offended is because it contaminates our relationships with other people. Hebrews chapter 12 says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. You see that, right? It doesn't say a fruit tree of bitterness. It, it doesn't say a palm tree of bitterness. It doesn't say a flower of bitterness. It says a root of bitterness. Because when bitterness is in our lives, we rarely recognize its symptoms. They're all underneath the surface. Like a, like a plant can grow a very well-developed root system long before it ever buds, long before it ever shows us its first leaves. And this is how bitterness works in our lives. And we wonder why my interactions with, why, why every time I interact with people do I feel like they're always out to get me? Why do, why do I seem to be getting offended so easily? And I would say the reason like if you find yourself easily offended or, or constantly on guard, constantly in the defensive posture, I would present to you that it's possible you have a root of bitterness in your life, a root of offense in your life, and God's desire for you is to uproot that thing and get rid of it Be because it affects every relationship you have. Maybe you guys are better than me, but if I have a really bad day, somebody offends me. Someone says something that I'm just like, that, that's, that's not how I am at all. Like they, or whatever it is, I can find myself coming home, and I'll be shorter with the kids. I'll have less patience. I'll be quick to get frustrated. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like, I love my wife more than any other person on this planet. She's amazing, truly my hero. I love this woman. But if I have really bad interactions during the day, if I'm not careful, I'll grab that trap of, of, of offense in my life, and it will come out towards her. I'll, I'll come out towards her like, 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 just not like angry or harsh, but like I can feel my posture. Uh, I can feel the way I'm interpreting what she says as though somehow she's the one that offended me. She's not. She's, she's actually a gift from God in my life. But if I latch on to offense somewhere else, I can allow what someone else did affect the relationships I value the most. Because bitterness and offense contaminate all of our relationships. The next thing is this, that it will hinder your walk with God. It'll contaminate your relationships, but it will hinder your relationship with God. Mark chapter 11, verse 25 says, and whenever you stand praying, so, so whenever you pray, forgive. Forgive. Listen to that. He doesn't say whenever you pray, ask God to forgive you. We do that. We repent. But he says whenever you pray, you need to forgive. 
If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, who is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. That's a really interesting caveat, because we're saved by grace through faith, aren't we? Like, like the, the way God interacts with us is through faith in him alone. And yet, and I don't understand this, and yet, he puts this caveat and says, if you will not release people from their, their offenses against you in your life, I won't release you. You cannot live a full life and have a bitter spirit. You cannot live a full life and have a bitter spirit. Often we think that offended, like this feeling offended, it's just something that's in my head. It's just this way I feel about something, but if I don't express it, it's not going to really affect anything. As long as I keep it inside, as long as I hide it from the, as long as I keep a straight face, it'll all be fine. But the Bible says that it affects your walk with God. It contaminates your relationships with others. And it hinders your walk with God. So today I ask you, are, are there any areas in your life that you're offended? Let me ask you a different question. Is there anyone or anything in your life that you blame? Because if there's something that you blame, someone you're offended towards, I'm telling you, that could very well be the thing that is preventing you from experiencing the abundant life that God has for you. Could it be that maybe an ex-spouse, you've, you've never got beyond the betrayal and, and you've held that offense for so long that it has, it has jaded your view towards any other future person? Could it be that maybe the way you interacted with a teacher at some point, they said something that was out of turn, and so now you just struggle, like, like you, you just hold that offense. I'm saying, like, you've got to let go. Maybe for you, it was a leader in your life, maybe a boss or a church leader that did something they shouldn't have done or said something that was harsh or, or mean or just their behavior was, was not the kind of behavior a leader should have. And I would ask you this, are, are you holding that against them? Because if you're still holding that against them, what you're really holding is the bad side of a trap. You drag it around your life, offended by what your husband said when he came home from work, grumpy. What your, what your wife said when she came home from work, exhausted. I think as Christians, one of the reasons we, we struggle with the uh, with forgiveness is we, we misunderstand what forgiveness really is. We preach it, but because we don't define it and define what it's not, we have unrealistic expectations. The first is this. Forgiving someone for an offense is not minimizing the offense. Like what they, did. it's not saying, oh, what you did was no big deal. Like it didn't even hurt me. I'm good. Like, like I have no, like I don't even think about it anymore. That's not what forgiveness is. It's not forgive and forget. Like that's garbage. Forgive and forget. That's, that's not true. Like you're never going to, I don't know about you, but like I've never been able to forgive and forget. Because forgive and forget is really this, this great ideal, but it's not real. It's not minimizing it and saying that what they did was good. It wasn't right what happened to you. The, the way you were treated was not okay. And it does hurt. But I'm telling you, the way you release it is through forgiveness. Not saying it's okay, but saying, I will not hold this account against you. Saying, I, I'm going to let go of this one. When we have offense in our life, it's like um, 
It's like smoking cigarettes and then blowing them in someone else's face. And like, I hope you get secondhand smoke poisoning. <laughs> like, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Really offended and, and bitterness, these roots of bitterness in our life, they only affect you. There's people that have offended you. They have no idea they offended you. And it's still eating you up to this day. Let me say this. You can forgive somebody even if they don't ask you to forgive them. Like, like you can forgive someone that is no longer walking on two feet. They may be dead now, but you can still forgive them. They may be alive, and they may still be doing what they're doing. They may not even be in the same room as you, and you can choose to forgive them. Imagine what our world would look like if Christians actually embraced the principle of forgiveness. So that's the first one. Is forgiveness is not minimizing it. But the second thing is this. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Now, we should have a goal towards reconciliation, but that's not forgiveness. Reconciliation is when the relationship is back the way it was. Forgiveness does not make that happen. Like, like I can release someone from the debt they owe me, but that doesn't mean I hold their hand and walk across the street again. Like, like I can be okay with the dog that bit me, but I don't put my hand back inside the cage. Forgiveness is releasing them from the debt that you hold in your heart. Reconciliation is when it comes back together, and that only happens under three circumstances. I'm going to put this up here. For somebody right now, maybe for you, you're like, I don't know if I can forgive this person because I feel like I'm just telling him it's okay. No, no, no. Reconciliation requires repentance. You can forgive someone that is not sorry. But to mend the relationship they have to have a place of, of repentance for what happened. They have to be sorry for it. The next is restitution. they got to make it right. Right? Someone stole 200 bucks from you, you can forgive them. But it doesn't mean you're letting them anywhere near your wallet until you get that $200 back. And the third one is rebuilding trust over time. This one takes... Time. Sometimes years. That's what reconciliation looks like. So today, for us to forgive someone, that's the first step. That's us saying, I'm no longer going to hold what you said against you. I'm no longer going to hold what you didn't do against you. So here's how we get there. First is this, we remember that we have been forgiven. We remember that we were forgiven. Ephesians 4.31 says this, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and all clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. My mom, I, I grew up with a, I grew up in a church home. Anybody else grow up like you grew up under the pews in a church? I don't know. That's, that's how I grew up. My mom, if I was arguing with my sisters, my mom would come in and she would use these, she would, my mama was a singing mama. And so she'd come into the house and, and me and my sisters would be just going at each other. And she'd be like, be ye kind one to another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven thee. Ephesians 4.32. Boom. <laughs> as a kid, this drove me, like, I, I, I didn't help, that didn't help me at all, right? That made things worse. I was like, I want to kill my sister now. Like, I'll show her kind. But it's true, as believers, we've got to come to a place where we recognize that, that last phrase, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you, 
Ephesians 4.32. Like, like you were forgiven for so much. Like, take a minute and pause and reflect and be like, God, you, you forgave me when I was far from you. When you were the last thing on my mind, you forgave me. When my words betrayed you, you forgave me. When my mind, when I, when I thought of evil and corrupting things, God, your grace forgave me. God, when I walked away from you, you forgave me. When I had nothing worth loving, you loved me. And so when I come back to that place and recognize that while I was yet a sinner, Jesus Christ died for me, I recognize that there's, some, there's something there that I cannot fabricate. There's something I can't create. It is the grace of God in my life. So when I forgive somebody else, it is simply me replicating what I've experienced. And then what we do is we name the offense. We remember that we've been forgiven, and then we name the offense. Often people... They'll forgive somebody, but it's still there. It's still lingering. And it's because they sort of generally forgive them. Like if your dad was never there. So you say, Dad, I forgive you for, for just never having been there. Like that's great. But that's not specific. I would encourage you to actually go through and say, Dad, I forgive you. For every time when I was in baseball, I would look up in the stands looking for your face. And I never saw your face in the stands. That hurt me. But I forgive you. Be, be specific. Actually name it. The next is this. You've got to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to forgive somebody, it comes from the power of of the Holy Spirit. And the moment I say that, some of you are like, oh no, crazy, crazy spirit stuff now. It's gonna get weird. No, 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 no. Like, people are weird. Holy Spirit's not weird. Now, I grew up in a church full of crazy Pentecostal people. So, like, I'm, I'm used to that. Like, I, 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 that's my frame. But some of you grew up in a church where, like, your frame for, like, what the Holy Spirit was was like, Father, Son, Bible. That's not how it goes. Like, you've got to accept the part of God that is, like, unpredictable and ultimately powerful and able to flow in and among. Like, nobody can tell where he's coming or where he's going. That's his role in your life. And that same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. So you've got incredible power inside of you. Why not exercise that power, even with forgiveness? Like, like, Holy Spirit, help me, because I am so offended right now. I'm so mad right now. Holy Spirit, calm the storm inside of me. Holy Spirit, help me to forgive her. Holy Spirit, help me to let him off the hook. Holy Spirit, I don't have it in me to release this person. Help me to release them. So we're... We depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. The third is this, as the band would come. We, we pray for God's best in their life. It doesn't mean reconciliation. It means you choose to use your words to bless them. You pray for them. Oh, pastor, I've been praying for him. I've been quoting Bible verses. Psalm 3, verse 7, arise, O Lord, and rescue me. My God, slap all my enemies in the face. Shatter the teeth of the wicked. Ah! Like, Lord, I love him, but he needs to slow down, break his leg. That's not the kind of prayers I'm talking about, somebody. I'm saying you've got to come to a place in your life where you recognize the one of the things that makes Christianity so unique. When Jesus entered into the Roman world, a lot of what Jesus taught was present in other philosophies and present in other religions, but there are some things he taught that are absent everywhere else. 
doing good to the poor. Lots of religions teach that. Nothing new. Being faithful to your spouse. Every religion teaches that. Nothing new. But when Jesus says things like this in Luke chapter 6, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Woo. Romans 12. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Pastor, I just wish you'd preach something deep. Preach something real deep and confuse us. Family, it does not get deeper than blessing those who have mistreated you. It does not get deeper than letting people off the hook and saying, God, you bless their life. You do your will in their world. God, may they come to full knowledge of you. Would you bless their kids and their family? Would you bless they may have they may have mistreated you in business, been unfair, but you begin praying, say, God, would you would you bless them, God? Would you pour out your blessings in their business? Would you would you do great things through them? Because when you pray for those that hurt you. God, I forgive her. God, I pray that everyone who enters into her life would show her the respect she deserves. God, I pray that you would, you would go before him, that you would have your way in his life and bless him in every direction he turns. What happens is every single time I begin praying for them and blessing them, God, would you, would you do a work in her? world. God, would you transform her mind? Would you give her just creative thoughts that would honor you and honor those around her? What happens is that trap that you've been holding on to, it begins to release. It begins to come back. You know, I, I grew up in, in the Yukon in Canada. And trapping is still a pretty common occupation there. And if somebody traps a beaver or maybe a coyote or something, and they don't get back to that animal quickly enough, there's an instinct inside the animal that went for the bait, and that instinct is to get away from the trap. And if they can't remove the trap from their hand, very often, a beaver, a wolf, anything else, will bite and chew at its own wrist until it eats through its own arm. And that animal will run away with three legs just to get out of the trap. And how many of us have experienced a trap of offense in our lives? And instead of praying and releasing the trap, God, would you do a work in her life? God, would you transform? God, would you bless them? God, would you, would you do a work through their children? Instead, what we do is we, we allow that frustration, that angst to just eat away at us. And we're not a whole person anymore. Would you stand with me all across the room? to be a forgiving people. But I think the first step, there's kind of two, two calls I'm going to make right now. First one is this. Many of us don't forgive because we've truly never experienced the forgiveness of God in our own lives. We hold on to offense because we've never been released from our offenses. And if that's you right now, I want to offer you the greatest gift you'll ever get. And that is the mercy of God. The grace of God that does not hold people's offenses against them. If you're in this place and you just want to experience the 
the forgiveness of God because you recognize that's for me. That's where I'm, I'm falling short is I need to experience his forgiveness. Would you put your hand up? Come on, we're bold people around here. We're not, we're not shy. Come on. Come on. I see those hands. Come on. Here's what we're going to do. If you raised your hand, I want you to join me in this, this simple prayer. It's how you're going to receive the forgiveness of God. It looks like this. We're going to repent and we're going to believe. Remember how I said that you can forgive somebody even if they don't ask for it? That's what God has already done for you. God God forgave you even though you didn't ask for it. Right now in this moment, all you're doing is you're, you're receiving a gift he's already given you. So you're going to repent. That means you're going to turn away from all the things you think, do, and say that you know don't please God. Then you're going to believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And when you do this, his blood cleanses us from all sin. The forgiveness of God washes through your life, and he'll put you in a right standing with him. Join me in a prayer like this. Your own word, something like this. God, right now, I'm turning away from who I used to be. Lord, I repent of the things I've said, done, and thought that I know don't please you. Would you forgive me? Forgive me, God. Lord, right now, I believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm placing all of my hope and faith in him. Say these words, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. And I'll follow you every day that I live. Come on, somebody. There's some people in this room that just experienced the forgiveness of God. Forgiveness of God. I just want to say this. You you may be sitting here right now and you're like, "I, I don't feel like anything changed. Forgiveness is not an emotion. The mercy of God is not an emotion. It is a fact from heaven. In fact, I will say it like this. You are forgiven. It's a statement. So next time you feel those lies and say, no, God still, there's something between you and God. It's a lie. You're forgiven. Now what I'd say is this. As a church body, are are there people that we need to forgive? Ask yourself this question. Who or what am I blaming? Who do I need to let off the hook in my life? It doesn't mean I'm going to, it doesn't mean we're reconciled. It doesn't mean everything's good. But it does mean I'm no longer going to hold this against them. Hold that person in your mind right now. And as we pray, I just want you to lift your hands like you're you're offering that that forgiveness up to the Lord. Just be like, Lord, you take it. Lord, right now, we forgive them. Lord, right now, it, it hurt, it was painful, and it was wrong. But Lord, you you are not just a consultant in our life, you are the Lord. And you ask us to demonstrate forgiveness. So God, I forgive them. We forgive her. We forgive him. We forgive that institution. We forgive those people. Lord, we will not hold it against them. God, would you bless them? God, would would you pour out your spirit in their homes? Lord, would their home become... A, a safe haven, like a place that people love to be, like a, a, a source of rescue. God, I pray you, you pour out business opportunities for their business. Lord, give them financial blessings in their life. Bless them, Jesus. So right now we, we forgive. In Jesus' name. says it like this. They they say, how how often do we need to do this? 
I think it's such a good question. Because for me, it just keeps coming back up over and over again, doesn't it? Forgive them. Jesus says, 70 times 7, 490. But he doesn't mean 437, 438. He doesn't mean that. What he means is every time that offense comes back in your heart, you say, I choose to live trap free. Every time I'm offended, I forgive her. And it comes up three weeks later, I forgive her. And when he does it again tomorrow, I forgive him. This is the grace of God demonstrated in our lives. Hey, I know that's a, a heavier word for somebody. But it'll change your life. We could, we, could, we could preach cotton candy and ice cream. But it does not get deeper than forgiveness. I love it whenever I preach on forgiveness. Usually the next week or two, I'll have people come up to me and pull me aside and say, I did it. And I've never felt this good. I want to challenge you this week. Do it. The most compelling argument you've ever heard. Do it. Hey, today we're doing baptisms and uh, pretty, pretty pumped about it. If you came to get baptized or if you're here right now and you're like, hey, I want to get baptized. Like maybe your faith is in Jesus, but you've never been baptized. Let me tell you, your next step is baptism. That, that is the next. It's not small groups. It's not join a team. It's baptisms. And so if that's you and you, you want to like jump in on this, you didn't plan on it, we've got shorts, we've got towels, we got shirts, we got hairspray, we got makeup, we got gold bond, we got whatever you need. We're gonna we're gonna help you out if you need to take a shower today. Not take a shower, take a get in a baptismal tank. So if you're getting baptized, head on over to the curtain and our team will direct you to where you're going. And if you wanna join them, you're like, I did not come intending to get baptized, we'll got you covered. You can respond to the Lord through baptism. Let's give them a hand, and let's worship the Lord. If you just gave your life to Christ, we're so incredibly proud of you, but we don't want to leave you hanging. We have next steps in the link in the description below. At the end of every service, we want to send you off with a blessing, so say this with me. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Have a wonderful Sunday. We'll see you next time.